I present here pivotal portions of an excellent debate that took place at Chapman University in California, March 2011. It was called The Nature of Reality. The question was, is there an ultimate reality, and can science account for that reality? Or, as I perceive the question, is ultimate reality physical or spiritual? I add commentary from my own perspective as a person who agrees and disagrees with points made by either side. I focus on the four panelists I found most relevant. Deepak Chopra, well-known author of books on spirituality. Michael Shermer, well-known author of books on science. Stuart Hameroff, who co-authored a paper with Roger Penrose on how consciousness plays an intrinsic role in the universe and Leonard Mladenow, who co-authored a book called The Grand Design, with Stephen Hawking, on how invoking God is not necessary to explain the universe. Michael Shermer, science historian and editor of Skeptic Magazine, goes first. We're going to run an experiment, because this, I claim, is a testable hypothesis. We're going to go to the roof. We have cameras to record the experiment. We have uh, data recorders to record this, and we're going to push you off one by one, <laughs> and if you truly believe there's no ultimate reality, your non-existing atoms will pass mysteriously through the non-existing atoms of the ground, and you will not be hurt. <laughs> End of story. So... I checked, they, they're calling me from risk management. <laughs> risk management, yes. <laughs> okay, they approved the experiment, so we won't be able to do that, sorry. Okay, so I'm a materialist, a monist, I'm not a dualist. I think humans are by nature dualists, that we think that there's an, a, an extra substance, a soul, a spirit, an agent, a hidden force, some kind of energy, a god, a gods, whatever. Uh, but that's a product of our brains uh, misperceiving uh, the world and, and infusing into it these hidden invisible uh, agents that we think are there that aren't really there. There is no mind. The mind is just one of these fuzzy words that gets thrown about that if we try to operationally define it carefully, we find we're just describing what the brain does. So mind is just a, a word to describe what the brain does. The soul is just a word, a fuzzy word, to describe our pattern of information, our memories, and, and our, uh, our essence and our being, which dies when we die, and so forth. It's no more mysterious, by the way, where you go after you die than where you were before you were born. Why does nobody get all fussed up about, well, where was I before I was born? I think Deepak no. does. <laughs> well, actually, that's right, he does, you're right. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, I've had this argument with him in previous lectures. <laughs> Shermer makes the point that as the neurons of the brain die one by one, so does your mind. That is indisputable as seen in the cases of Alzheimer's and other diseases. And he asks, where does Aunt Millie's mind go after she dies? Implying that if we can't find it, then it no longer exists. So, and this idea that with the observer, like something like reality doesn't exist without the observer, therefore the moon doesn't exist, without uh, an observer, if you don't see it, it, does, it isn't really there. Uh, well, to quote Bill O'Reilly, tides come in, tides go up. <laughs> Never a miscommunication. Therefore, there's a God. Right. So the tides work because of the moon. It doesn't matter whether it, they're observed or not. They happen anyway, and they will without us. Shermer's inference is that the physical universe is ultimate reality not we humans or our minds. Deepak Chopra speaks next. I'm going to be a little more affirmative and less ambiguous because I'm not an academic and I can risk my reputation. He's already called me Dr. Woo Woo in many occasions. <laughs> and he's already spoken of my language as the quantum flap doodle. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on the fringe and I don't mind being. Chopra goes on to talk about ultimate reality as consciousness. Now, granted, defining what consciousness is strains the capacity of human logic, but I found his comments somewhat tautological and not especially enlightening. So is there an ultimate reality? The answer for me is yes. 
that the ultimate reality is the ground of existence which many Eastern wisdom traditions have called consciousness. Now there's an argument, what is consciousness? You'll hear different opinions of what is consciousness. Here's my definition of consciousness. Consciousness is the ground of existence. And now, by the way, when I say existence, I'm not meaning anything esoteric. I'm meaning that which exists. Consciousness is the ground of existence that differentiates into everything we call reality. Our thoughts. Can you, be can you have thoughts without consciousness? Answer is no. Our cognition, our perception, our uh, behavior, our speech, our biology, our social interactions, our personal relationships, our environment, our interaction with the forces of nature, these are differentiated aspects of this very fundamental reality which we cannot conceive of because it is the source of our conception, which we cannot perceive because it's the source of our perception. See, when we say is there an ultimate reality and the sci will science will ever be able to dis uh, disclose it, I will say no. Science will never be able to disclose it because science is an activity in consciousness. Science, mathematics, these are activities in consciousness. Can you imagine a world without, outside of consciousness? You can't because you have no way of stepping out of consciousness. Then, as I understood it, Chopra refers to the subatomic level of matter as being not solid and undeterministic which I think scientifically is the case, and that somewhere in there is ultimate reality, a non-material something. I am saying to you today that I hope by this evening we will see the ultimate and climactic overthrow of the superstition of materialism. Because everything you call matter is non-material. Everything that you call physical is non-physical. If you go down to the most fundamental levels of nature, you go beyond, forget the observer effect, which is ridiculous, by the way, the way he describes it, because according to him, the observers of the universe were created by the objects of the universe. I think that last sentence does make sense, that conscious observers cannot have been created by the objects of the universe. Well, the way I think of it is that consciousness must have come from consciousness an ultimate consciousness we can call God, and not from matter or physical forces which are consciousness-less entities. Chopra goes on to say that we humans do have minds, we're not just zombies, we do have non-physical spiritual attributes beyond that of a strictly physical brain. Okay, so if you are there, an observer, which he says is a fiction, okay, but then he's using his mind to uh, express his arguments. A brain. Th th his brain, yeah. So we don't even have to address him. It's a brain. <laughs> okay? It's a brain. We are all zombies. We have no free will. We have no insight. We have no intuition. We have no creativity. We have no imagination. We have no choice. These are all the, my synaptic networks. You know? when in fact even the synaptic networks are made out of atoms, the atoms are subatomic particles, and the particles are not things. The essential nature of the material world is that it's not material. The essential nature of the physical world is it's not physical. The essential stuff of the universe is non-stuff. Okay, now the question is, what is this non-stuff from where we all come? Is it just an empty void, or could it be the womb of creation? Does nature go to exactly the same place to create a galaxy of stars, a cluster of nebulas, a rainforest, a human body, or a thought? So the question is, let us figure out today what is the relationship between consciousness, energy, information, and matter. Could they all be the same thing in different disguises? I do agree with Chopra that when we talk to a person, we're talking to a person, not just a brain or a collection of molecules, and that we humans are more than just complex machines, the result of our genetics and environment. When I first heard Deepak say, womb of creation, I felt he was just invoking a vague metaphor that provides no real insight. 
which is what most atheists, I surmise, would think he did. But upon reflection, I think I understand what he's claiming. That it is at the subatomic level, which seems to be immaterial, that the universe was created. And that is also where spirituality, which is immaterial, may exist. And that the spiritual is the real glue that holds the world together. Well, I kind of doubt that quantum physics will ever verify that. But I do agree with Chopra that ultimate reality is spiritual rather than physical. That being said, <laughs> let me make it clear, I am not a fan of Chopra's. I think he promotes too much New Age baloney. And I am a fan of Shermer's. I think virtually everything Shermer says and writes is eminently reasonable. Yet, I disagree with Shermer on this basic question of what constitutes ultimate reality. I think the world is ultimately spiritual, not physical. I agree with Shermer that there is no mind over matter that breaches the laws of nature, and that there is no God, as traditionally understood, who intervenes in the world, answering prayers, doing miracles, providing sacred scripture, and so on. Yet, I do think there is some great intelligence behind the universe and that positing this great intelligence is a better ultimate explanation for the universe than a never-ending advance of further and further and further scientific knowledge. Even if scientists eventually come up with a unified theory of everything, you're still left with the question of who or what created that theory. Anyway, that's my opinion. Let's get back to the debate. Stuart Hameroff, a professor of anesthesiology and psychology, speaks next. I take this question literally, and by that I mean uh, I look at the fundamental level of the universe. If you go down in scale below the level of atoms, uh, 20, uh, 25 orders of magnitude smaller, you get to the Planck scale, uh, where there's information embedded. And at that level, there, there's something going on. Now, uh, this debate, dispute about whether there's an ultimate reality or not, goes back to Bohr and Einstein. They've heard that, that Bohr was making quantum measurements, giving beautiful results, uh, but it seemed to indicate that, that, that underneath those quantum measurements, reality was ambiguous or unclear or, or, or random or chaotic. And that was fine with Bohr. He was happy to make his measurements and, and, and do great things. Einstein wasn't pleased. He thought there was an underlying reality. He didn't know what it was, but he believed that underneath all, all those quantum measurements, something was, was there and was real and had information. Now, the, the modern counterparts of, the, of those two giants, in some sense, are Stephen Hawking and, and Roger Penrose. Hawking follows Bohr in that uh, there's no... Uh, oh, uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, Hawking uh, and Leonard and Lonnell follow Bohr in that uh, they're kind of ambiguous or vague about whether there's a reality. If there isn't, well, no big deal. And they take, uh, of course, they apply string theory to the Planck scale where these strings are vibrating, but they don't say or can't account for what the strings are vibrating in. Now, Penrose, on the other hand, says that at this Planck scale, at this very fundamental level of the universe, is geometry. Uh, quantum gravity, quantum geometry, spin networks, twister theory, there's various approaches but some kind of pattern or information that, in, that is encoded. And he goes on to say that encoded at that level are values, platonic values, mathematical truth, perhaps even aesthetic and ethical values, and the precursors of consciousness, as well as perhaps the, the forces and constants that give rise to our universe. Uh, Pedro says that this information, it, it, there's a cosmic blueprint, if you will, embedded at this fundamental level, and it includes the precursors of consciousness. This implies that consciousness didn't emerge uh, happenstance during the course of evolution as kind of an after-the-fact epiphenomenon. Now, Penrose and I have, have come up with a theory that makes a connection between quantum processes in the brain and this fundamental level of the universe to access these platonic values and proto-conscious entities built into the universe. The idea that conscious, the brain processes, quantum biology, connect to this fundamental level uh, gets into Deepak's territory because it's very consistent with a lot of Vedic and Buddhist ideas that consciousness and spirituality, uh, and, and, and at this fundamental level, there's non-locality, which means things repeat over, time, over space and time, and in some sense holographic uh, at different scales, so that they can percolate up and be accessed 
and selected by conscious processes in the brain. This is the fundamental uh, idea of the, of the uh, theory that, uh, that Penrose and I have come up with. So uh, I don't believe that, that uh, the mind is an emergent property uh, or doesn't exist at all, as Michael was saying. And nor do I quite, go quite as far as Deepak that consciousness is everything. But I think this stuff at the bottom, this fundamental space-time geometry, includes all this information on the blueprint of the universe, including the precursors of consciousness, so that our brains have evolved to the point where we can access and select and even be influenced and guided by information embedded in the fundamental level of the universe. And I think that's kind of a, a bridge, a potential bridge. Uh, and I should say, Roger doesn't, doesn't go into spiritual questions. He leaves that to me. Uh, and I have nothing to lose either because I make my living passing gas as an anesthesiologist. <laughs> but I think that, I seriously think that quantum processes in the brain connect us to this fundamental level, and that's a potential bridge between science and spirituality. Shermer has a response to Chopra and Hameroff. Okay, Deepak, when you use phrases like womb of creation, this is what I'm talking about with the Dr. Wu of stuff. Um, it's not precise, and I have a feeling you don't mean it metaphorically, poetically, etc., which would be fine, but I have a feeling that's not how you're using it. So that, that's a problem. Consciousness is in the same category. It, it's not clearly defined. So you said at the, basis, at the base of reality is consciousness, and then you ventured a, a definition of consciousness. It's the ground of existence. At the base of reality is the ground ex of existence. Reality is existence. Existence is existence. You've explained nothing. That's tautological. This is like saying gravity is the tendency for objects to attract to one another. Why do objects attract to one another? Because of gravity. See, it doesn't explain anything. See, we have to have operationally defined, uh, testable hypotheses about these things. Now, Stuart. You still, I, what I would like to know, if you, I'd like you to answer this question. Where is Aunt Millie's mind when her brain is disintegrating in Alzheimer's or senility? Where did it go? If it, if it still exists somewhere, where is it and can we test it? Because that would be indistinguishable from it not existing at all if you just say we can't access it. I just think uh, the, the key word here on quantum consciousness is baloney. <laughs> Thank you. Three minutes. Three minutes. So, Michael, uh, whenever he doesn't understand anything, he uses words like baloney, woo, etc. <laughs> you, you have a god being in the presence of physicists who were colleagues of Heisenberg and Wolfgang Pauli to say quantum consciousness, baloney, observer, baloney. You have real. That's just an important authority. Okay. That's just Chopra goes on to make the point that if you think of a sunset, you have a picture of that sunset in your brain. But where is that picture? It can't be found. It is a well-known dilemma because there's no theory. Your brain, which is inside your head, has no experience of the external world. The brain cells respond to pH, electrolytes, hormones, body temperature, and ultimately electrical ionic shifts. How does it create the experience of the external world? There's no theory. The scientists say we'll have a theory. It's a promissory note. And in this economic, in this economic environment, we're not accepting promissory notes. Okay. We have no idea how inanimate matter became animate. We have no idea how the human nervous system, which is an activity of the universe, is self-referential. We have too many questions that we don't know. So, is there an ultimate reality? If there is, science is not going to be able to answer it. We have to go beyond this mechanistic, reductionist, obsolete science, which is frozen in an obsolete worldview. It, that obsolete worldview looks only at the universe out there, at the objects, totally ignoring the observer, which is a myth. So, I'm not arguing with Michael. I'm arguing with the synaptic networks. Okay? Uh, <laughs> I think Chopra is essentially saying that when it comes to human beings, there are things beyond the scope of science. And I think that's a valid point. But Chopra also believes in a lot of New Age nonsense. Past lives, mind over matter, stuff he presents as more advanced spirituality. 
And on that score, I agree with Shermer that that is baloney. So I don't give Chopra any credibility in the world of New Age paranormal ideas, but I do see merit in his emphasis on the spiritual side of man in the world of our human emotions, our deeper human emotions, where science does not really provide insight. Experiences of love, beauty, honor, laughter, redemption. These are realities that are non-material beyond science, yet they are absolutely key to the definition of being a human being. Friendship, for example, to me is a real thing. There is no such physical entity as friendship. It is not subject to scientific verification. Yet it is a very real thing existing in some non-physical dimension of reality. So the argument that he used in that, in that piece, which he referred to uh, quantum quackery, which I resent as a physician, by the way, so I think you're, you're full of baloney. Um, and finally, I don't think Shermer is saying Hammeroth's research is quackery, but his conclusions or his inferences are. Um, and Millie. Okay. So, um, I've been asked this a number of times, uh, you know, near-death experience, out-of-body experiences, and most recently a TV show on, about reincarnation, and they had this kid who had memories of a World War II uh, fighter pilot who died, and there's no way the kid can know these, these details. And they asked me, well, how do you explain that, wise guy? And uh, I said, well, you know, I don't know for sure, and I can't validate this, this is true, but there certainly are a lot of anecdotal stories about, about this that seem hard to explain. So I said, in our view, that consciousness is happening uh, in the brain, in the microtubules, in the neurons, but going down to the plant scale geometry. Still there? <laughs> going down to the plant scale geometry between the ears. Now, when the, when the blood stops flowing, the heart stops, the brain becomes acidotic. Uh, ischemic, uh, there's no blood flow. The quantum information, the microtubules stop uh, coher being coherent, but the quantum information in the Planck scale isn't lost, but can uh, delocalize or dissipate to the universe at large and remain in the Planck scale <clears throat> non locally. So uh, it's conceivable. I, I, you know, I'm not saying that I don't claim evidence, but I'm claiming a scientific plausibility for consciousness out of the body after death that could even, in the Planck scale, non-locally distributed, but remaining as a soul, if you will, a quantum soul, by entanglement, which could, in principle, go back inside another uh, zygote or embryo, and the microtubules inside another zygote, zygote embryo. So I think that's, that's scientifically uh, possible. So Hamroff is saying reincarnation is scientifically possible. I suppose it is possible, in theory, that reincarnation could take place at this quantum, subatomic, microscopic level. But practically speaking, in straightforward macroscopic examination, these claims of reincarnation and past lives all turn out to be BS. There has been no authenticated case of reincarnation, and this is what Shermer knows. When Hameroff says with assurance, there is no way this kid could know these details, Sherman knows by his extensive experience that there is, in fact, a way the kid could know these things. There is inevitably a natural explanation. You do not have to go down to the subatomic level to look for a scientific explanation or have to posit some supernatural explanation. The famous case of Bridie Murphy comes to mind. People said there was no way this woman, who had never been to Ireland, could know so much and in such detail about Ireland unless she had a previous life in Ireland. Well, guess what? It turns out when she was growing up, she had a neighbor who was an Irish immigrant and she had spent a lot of time with this person. Not to mention that at one point there was a World's Fair near where she lived and this World's Fair had an Irish village exhibit. There are natural explanations. But you see, this, this is an example here where Stuart said he was going to define consciousness so language matters. But he didn't. He just said, it's what goes away when I give him anesthesia. That's not the definition of consciousness. Just tell us what you think it is. It's a self-collapse of the wave function. Objective reduction is defined by Penrose. Superposition reaches a threshold, has a moment of consciousness. That happens roughly 40 times a second in our brains. It, acts, it, it connects brain processes, including the cognitive information, to the fundamental level of the universe where the proto-conscious uh, qualia are, and that's what consciousness is. But he doesn't get that. Stuart, you know. Yeah. Uh, I didn't quite get it either. It seemed to me like a lot of words and disjointed concepts, not a rational explanation. 
My life experience tells me that when someone gives an explanation and talks very fast and piles on a lot of information, that that person is not really explaining, but is trying to impress or to obfuscate or to win the argument, not trying to explain. Contrast Hameroff's explanation here with Mladenov's explanation later of the concept of non-locality. Mladenov gives a nice, clear explanation. Of course, I'm not sure consciousness can ever be defined, because it's such an elemental, primordial thing. The concept of time would be another such primordial thing. How do you really define the essence of time? You can talk around it, maybe give some properties, but you end up essentially with a circular definition. Webster's defines time as the measured or measurable period during which an action, process, or condition exists or continues. So time is essentially a measured period. A measured period of what? Of time. <laughs> so the definition ends up depending on the meaning of the word itself in the first place. Yet we all have a good sense of what time is. What is consciousness? I don't know. The ability to be aware? And what is the essence of that ability? What is the essence of consciousness? I don't know. Some intangible elemental quality of life that is nonetheless very real. I'm not sure we need to take it any further in defining it than to say consciousness is awareness or intelligence and we all know what it is. The question is, does consciousness imply that ultimate reality is spiritual rather than material? What is more real? The giant rock that fell on your friend and killed him? Or your friendship? Obviously, the rock is more real. It killed him. Obviously, the friendship is more real. The rock is just an inanimate object. <laughs> What's real life? Molecules or emotions? Personally, I think emotions are, not just any emotions, but the deep emotions associated with our most meaningful experiences. And yet, I strongly support the shermer Mladenow position when it comes to phony claims of mind over matter beyond the limits of science, or when it comes to religious people constantly invoking the supernatural. Here's Mladeno responding to Hameroff. I have to say, to, to, to a physicist, the physics that you spoke there sounds like Greek spoken backwards. Yeah, because it doesn't mean anything. What? He's I'm glad I mean the, the cause of the collapse of the wave front. What are you talking about? Well, okay, let me answer. Okay, okay, okay guys. This is what the action is. You're using the physics terminology, but... It's not the observer effect, okay? You don't need... Board, what are you talking about? Let's just take one thing I understand. I understand the collapse of the wave function. Can you tell me what you're talking about? It's a self-collapse of the wave function. What does that mean? Penrose, okay, it, Penrose objective reduction, which he uh, postulated in 89 as the mechanism for consciousness, means when you have a superposition that avoids decoherence by E equals H over T. E equals the, is the superposition separation and gravitational self-energy. H is Planck's constant over 2 pi. T is the time at which we'll reach the self-collapse, this objective reduction. When that happens, it's a moment of consciousness. Uh, something like a whitehead occasion of experience, like a boot, a boot is a moment of awareness. It's a moment of consciousness. It happens 40, roughly 40 times a second at gamma synchrony rates, or, or higher, uh, faster if, if you're in an excited state. And that's how we have 40 or more moments of consciousness per second. What, what, what is a wave function, Stuart? Okay. Okay. It's a soup that gets it, well, I think it's real. I think it's real. I think these are just terms being thrown together, with some from biology, some from physics. And they don't have any meaning. This is the moment for the audience. Deepak makes a point that if you ask someone to pay attention to what someone else is saying, and you do, that activity in your brain is not a specific thought, but is consciousness, you paying attention. Deepak then accuses the other side of avoiding the concept of non-locality. If I understood correctly, to Deepak, non-locality can be identified as that domain outside of space and time, and that this domain is to him a scientific fact that confirms the spiritual world. Maladin now responds by giving a definition of non-locality in terms of quantum physics and implies that this scientific principle does not confirm Deepak's alleged spiritual world. This is very simple. Okay, in normal experience, if two things are to affect each other, they have to have contact. So 
Is Michael going to throw you off the roof? He has to be there with you and throw you off the roof or depart. And so they, they have to have contact in space. That's called locality. Something that affects something else has to be local. Even if there's a force between two objects, there's a force field that makes it happen. It doesn't just happen across space. So in quantum theory, there's an effect where um, something can be kind of in two places at one time in a way, which I won't get into because I don't want to go over the two minutes. But, but as a result, when you do something at one side, to one of the locations, the, the other location, which is not in contact, which is, could be at the other side of the universe, light years away, is affected by what you did here. That's non-locality. The, the, something that is not locally, not in the same place, doesn't touch it, doesn't communicate with it, can affect something that happens elsewhere. Okay, so that's just in a, in a basic level what non-locality means. But it's important to know that, that it, it, it's a subtle thing, and you can't use it, say, to communicate faster than light or anything like that. New Agers, or as Shermer refers to them, Team Deepak, tend to appropriate Heisenberg's uncertainty principle as scientific confirmation for all kinds of mind over matter and paranormal nonsense. They'll say, see, this is the scientific principle that shows physical reality is not as set as you unimaginative non-believers think. But Heisenberg's Uncertainty principle applies only to the microscopic level, not the macroscopic level. The macroscopic level is pretty well set and consistent. I refer you to Shermer's proposed experiment of dropping people off a high roof. Do you really think you will not get injured? Julia Sweeney has a CD called Letting Go of God, and I'm going to take the liberty of including a couple minutes of it here, because I think she has a good perspective on the very topic of this debate. In my confusion, I found someone who had thought about this topic a lot, someone who made it clear. Now at this point, I knew a little bit of science, but not a lot, and that made me the perfect candidate for Deepak Chopra. <laughs> I read The Way of the Wizard, Ageless Body, Timeless Mind, The Quantum Alternative to Growing Old, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, and How to Know God. I basked my way through Deepak's books. I thought I'd get it. God is energy and intention and the quantum field or something. Deepak says that by perceiving changelessness, time ceases to exist. I love Deepak. I did an interview on The View on ABC, and Deepak also happened to be a guest on the exact same show, and I gushed all over him in the green room telling him how wonderful he was. I did notice that he looked a little older than he looked on his book jacket, and I wondered if his perceived timelessness was working on his own body. <laughs> I told him how his books were helping me understand what and who God was, what ultimate reality was, and Deepak says the world is the creation of the observer and the body is information and energy spanning the universe. Consciousness is the ground of all being. It created us and we are part of it. Deepak believes that we can tap into this big consciousness with our awareness and that it is the source of all creativity and intention and synchronicity. And if you want proof, well, the exotic field of quantum mechanics proves all of it. I was really enthralled with how Deepak was using science, the cutting edge science of quantum mechanics. This was so much better than using myths and superstitions to find spirituality. This was using science and physics to find spirituality. I was so intrigued by this quantum mechanics that Deepak refers to over and over and over again in his books that I decided to take a class in it. And what I found is that Deepak Chopra is full of shit. <laughs> go back in time, and instead of gushing at Chopra, I wanted to say, Deepak, what the hell are you doing? There is no universal consciousness that can be demonstrated with quantum mechanics. There is no healing of the body or arresting of the aging process through telepathy. I mean, sure, subatomic waves and particles do behave in perplexing and very strange ways to us, especially when we try to measure them, apparently. But that doesn't mean that there are angels or that the universe wants me to make more money. I mean, I know this, and I just took one measly class. The moderator wraps up the debate with a final question for the panel. And by the way, I love this guy's accent. So, and the question is, 
Werner Heisenberg was quoted as saying, what we see is not nature around us, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. Can you tell us whether you agree, disagree, and explain why? Maybe we start with Stuart. Just in case you're not familiar with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, it's roughly this, that at the subatomic level, you can determine the location of a particle, but not at the same time its speed. And you can determine its speed, but not at the same time its location. Yeah, Heisenberg was stopped by a, uh, uh, a cop for speeding, and he said, do you know how fast you're going? And Heisenberg said, no, but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, not, I, 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 I'm not sure, actually. I didn't quite follow the question, but, but let me just make the point that... <laughs> that you don't need a conscious observer outside science, that, as Bohr and Wigner and, and a lot of uh, the Copenhagen, in, in our view, consciousness is intrinsic in the universe. It's on the edge between the quantum and classical worlds. It's related to something that's been there all along. You don't, you don't, we don't want to put it outside science. I'll just leave it at that. Deepak, do you want me to read again? Or? No, I get the question. I'm very familiar with the quote, and Heisenberg is ex exactly correct. We do not see nature as it is, but we see nature as it is exposed to a method of questioning. The scientific method of questioning is a particular method which is based on a fundamental subject-object split. So you know that I am the subject and there is the object and nature is the object. But my question is how do you get outside of nature to observe? You know, how do you measure the universe from inside the universe because you are as much an activity of the universe. So science is a method for exploring a particular map of the truth, but it's not a method for exploring ultimate reality. Thank you. Michael? The Heisenberg quote, I just wrote, this would, no, this would imply that any, anyone's method of questioning is just as valid as anyone else's. The astrologer's questions about the universe are just as valid as the astronomer's. Well, maybe in some philosophical drinking club, but if you want to get a spacecraft to Mars, you use astronomy. The questions those guys ask are way better than the astrologers by any objective standard. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you again, our panelists.